so for anyone who has the files already, um, if you go to this web page, uh, it will actually explain how you can kick off the build of the Vagrant environment. And if you're ready to do so, I'd recommend that you start that right now because it's a time consuming process. So the faster, you, the, the, the sooner you start, the, the more likely you are to get the whole way through the exercise and get to the stage of being able to fail over a, um, a control plane. So uh, what you're looking for in, in the readme, once you've gone through the prerequisites, um, it, there's basically a one-line command, a, a build.sh, and you can just run that, uh, run that script, and it will start. It will do the vagrant up um, and a few other things, and you will you will start to see virtual machines building. And once they're all built, then it will start building a cluster. So um, yeah, feel free to start on that right now if you're able, or, or as soon as you have the files. Basically, um, we're, we're probably looking at on the hardware that. Um, that we've been using it, it's like 20, 25 minutes to build the four nodes or something like that. So it, ta it takes a while. Sharing, sharing yeah, the next yeah. session over VNC isn't, and, and, and integrating it into the presentation is not a problem at all. No, I'd like to see um, Shell in a Box uh, grow uh, Socket.io support, like Reveal does. And that would be cool. Yeah, yeah. To basically subscribe to, uh, to the terminal where it's, where it's currently getting updated. Can I do one more next? What's that? So it looks like the USB stick is free again, right? So if anyone doesn't have the files yet and wants them, there they are.
the venue because an Indian friend of his apparently had an accident and was scared to the hospital. Oh, yeah, here, man. Which is doubly awkward. <laughs> yeah, but we're really too busy to just have to leave. <laughs> it's a paper chip one. <laughs> We we also if you don't have uh Vagrant and VirtualBox, and you're running on something other than OS X, we may be able to help, I think. I think we have the downloads. S somebody at the back looking for the, the files, I guess. Just out of curiosity, uh, can I have a show of hands who's planning to actually follow along uh, on their laptops versus, yeah, so. Quite a few. And how many people actually have the files already? Great. Okay. It was worth the effort. <laughs> okay. So we're about getting ready to start. So could everyone please take their seats and then we're going to kick off this tutorial. Is that on? Should be on. It's pretty quiet. Okay, this is the uh, automated deployment of a highly available OpenStack cloud tutorial. Uh, this being a tutorial, it's a double slot, so uh, we've got, you, uh, you, you're going to have us blabbing at you for the next uh, hour and a half or so. Um, and as Adam said uh, in the run-up or, or in the intro, uh, we have this virtual environment for you to follow along. Uh, doing so is entirely optional. If you, if you choose not to follow along this afternoon, you'll still take plenty out of this talk, and all the materials are available to you and will be available for the next few weeks. So uh, if you want to duplicate this tutorial from the comfort of your home or office, that is perfectly fine. If you prefer to just sit back and watch the show for now, that's okay too. Uh, in order for the show to actually uh, succeed, we need your help here really quickly. Uh, Adam has prepared something very important uh, for this talk, uh, and that is uh, uh, Adam has uh, prepared a chicken sacrifice. Uh, and because uh, we, of course, don't want to offend any vegetarians or vegans in the room, the chicken is made of paper. Um, so, uh, for the chicken sacrifice, uh, we're just going to need you to hum along some positive energy, please, while uh, Adam rips up this chicken. So, could you please join me in hmm? Thank you for okay. the good karma. Just that might not have made sense to a lot of people. Ah, uh, it's fine. <laughs> but it will make sense to anyone who's given a, a technical demo in front of a live audience before. But the, the chicken sacrifice is an essential part of having even a hope of it working. <laughs> okay, uh, so you already got the uh, material, you, got the, you saw the README, you got all that. Uh, you also uh, have, because people always ask us for slides uh, or take pictures of the slides during the talk or whatever, this is a direct link to the slides that we're presenting here. By all means, please feel free to peruse those now or later on so you can use those for uh, skipping back and forth in the talk uh, whichever you would like to do, okay? Um, so, that's that. Uh, first up, uh, what you're going to learn, what you're going to take out of this uh, tutorial. There's a few things that we're going to be talking about. Uh, so, first of all, 
why would we even want OpenStack HA? Uh, we're not going to go into that in too much detail because I think it's safe to assume if you turn up for this tutorial, you already know that you want HA in OpenStack and you know why you want it. But we're going to go over it very, very briefly. Uh, then we're going to focus specifically on how SUSE Cloud does it. Now, that's not to say that SUSE Cloud is the only vendor product out there that does HA or is the only vendor product out there that does HA right. It's simply such that we have another talk in the conference, uh, in the main conference program on uh, Wednesday, and that is at 3.40 p.m., if I remember correctly, in room 252, uh, where I'm doing basically a vendor neutral overview over various um, HA approaches that are uh, that are pursued by various vendors and how they roll that into their project uh, products. Um, but before we go into that, um, you have a right to know just who the heck you're dealing with. Um, and um, first up, um, Adam has a much cooler daytime job than you or me or any of us. Uh, Adam happens to be a professional classical jazz and tango cellist uh, who also moonlights as an engineer at SUSE. Uh, and that picture is actually from the London Tango Orchestra, of which uh, Adam is a member. Uh, myself, my name is Florian Haas. Uh, I do much more boring things uh, when, I, when I'm not sort of at work, uh, which is uh, food and travel and photography. When people ask me where I am based, I tend to jokingly answer in seat 10C, because planes is where I spend most of my time. Uh, and uh, I am uh, one of the uh, co-founders of Hastexa. We are a professional services company that provides vendor neutral consulting uh, for, and training for not only OpenStack, but also distributed storage and high availability, all of which is kind of rolled into SUSE Cloud. So um, all of these things that we're talking about today are sort of near and dear to my heart and things that I tend to care about. Um, and the same thing is true for Adam. Okay, so why would we want high availability in OpenStack? What's the motivation for even considering uh, a, a, high, a high availability solution in OpenStack? Because on face value, uh, when you sort of read some of the OpenStack materials and some of the OpenStack documentation, and specifically the OpenStack design tenets that were formulated sometime between the Austin and Bexar release, if I remember correctly, um, Pretty much everything in OpenStack ought to be distributed, everything ought to be shared nothing, so therefore if we lose any component at any given time, then we always have another that takes over automatically and everything is fine and dandy and wonderful and cinnamon rolls and sunshine. Uh, but it turns out that that's not really the case. Uh, and so there is a very, very valid point and a very valid case to make for uh, high availability in OpenStack. Um, first of all, I'm sure that um, quite a few of you are familiar with one version or another uh, of this little diagram, of this little chart. This is a grossly simplified overview of the various components that uh, are part of OpenStack today. As you can see, there's no trove here, there's no heat here, there's no oscillometer. So this is really sort of the minimum viable uh, compute cloud that you can build with OpenStack today, uh, which typically consists of Keystone, our central identity service. Uh, we have an image store, which may or may not actually store its images in, in OpenStack object storage. Uh, we have a compute layer, we have a network layer, we have uh, a block storage layer to provide persistent storage to virtual machines that are otherwise ephemeral by default. And we have a unifying API layer and dashboard on top of all that, right? So I'm sure you've seen uh, one or another version of this. It uh, originally came from uh, Ken Peppel as part of the uh, OpenStack documentation. But even if you look at this sort of very, very simplified view of OpenStack, you can readily identify uh, at least five services in here that do, in fact, rely on some sort of replicated or shared state. Uh, and uh, like, for example, uh, for Keystone, for our, for our identity providers, uh, we need some sort of um, shared identity backend, um, which then needs to be highly available and needs to be replicated in some shape or form uh, if we want any sort of uh, redundancy of our data in there. So whether we're using a, a, an SQL backend with MySQL or we're using LDAP or whichever, we've got this store here that needs to be persistent, that is stateful, and that needs to be replicated or duplicated or otherwise made highly available. 
Um, the same thing is true, of course, for compute storage, for image storage, block storage, and network, because even though either of those uh, may use um, uh, an, an off-site data store, may take care of replication by themselves, um, they have something really, really important that they do need to keep, keep track of themselves, and that is the metadata for volumes, for example, for images, for networks, and so forth. So even in this very, very simplified view, we can readily see that there are a bunch of services where we absolutely need HA simply in order to keep their data available. And then there's a number of other services um, where this whole we can have as many active components as we possibly want doesn't really fly. So two examples where that has historically been a bit of an issue uh, is are the uh, the Nova scheduler, the Cinder scheduler, but also the uh, Neutron L3 agents at some point, for which we had the Neutron L3 agent specifically, we had sort of a kludge to fix this up to this point, uh, and we're finally getting something really interesting there. Well, it's actually in Juno, but it's marked experimental there, um, but it's landing in Kilo, um, or it's ex expected to land as a fully, featured, uh, fully supported feature in Kilo. More on that uh, in my talk on Wednesday. Okay, so uh, we absolutely have a need for high availability, for example, on our AMQP bus. Um, now, this is relatively simple uh, in that uh, we absolutely can't do without it. Pretty much, uh, well, not all of the OpenStack services, but a great majority of the OpenStack services rely on the availability of either RabbitMQ or Cupid or some other messaging broker. Uh, so we can't really uh, run an OpenStack cloud without this, but thankfully, the information that we have in there that we need to keep in there is not exactly stateful. Um, so uh, messages that are shared on a message bus uh, are typically, they have a lifetime of like 30 seconds or less. And uh, if any message ever gets dropped, then an OpenStack service must essentially resend it. So it can never really rely on uh, the, the reliable delivery of, of this message. Uh, so therefore, the only thing, quote unquote, the only thing that uh, a highly available infrastructure must ensure is that we always have either RabbitMQ or uh, Cupid actually available two services. Um, but we don't really need to worry about replicating their state. This is vastly different when we talk about, for example, our metadata, uh, our, our persistent metadata backend, which is normally a relational database management system. It's frequently MySQL. In the SUSE Cloud case, it happens to be Postgres. Um, and here, uh, it's actually much more challenging, which is we also can't do without it. Pretty much every OpenStack service wants to store metadata in a database. Uh, but here in this case, uh, it's also very, very stateful. So the, the, the information that we keep in the database is something that we absolutely need to protect. Uh, and in case of a failover, we absolutely need to make that um, information available on the machine that we fail over to, which in other words means that we need to replicate its data in the first place. Okay. So much more challenging there. So uh, in fact, uh, what does this infrastructure high availability actually do for us? Well, one of the things that we want to ensure is um, service availability. So this does not only mean the services that OpenStack consists of itself, but also the services like RabbitMQ, like uh, RDBMS, like whatever, um, uh, is um, uh, this kind of stuff that we uh, that we need to keep available uh, and that we need to keep essentially sort of a defined number of instances of. So that's one thing that we absolutely need to do. However, what we also need to do is in a highly envir uh, available environment, we also need to make sure that uh, all the data that all of these services need is available, is consistent, uh, and is, uh, is, as a consequence, that means that we need to properly replicate it. Okay? So, um, now, Approaching high availability tends to be, in present day OpenStack, uh, one of the key differentiators of the OpenStack vendors out there. Okay? Um, so uh, you're, and they're going to differentiate along the following lines. First, what's the deployment facility? Uh, what are the deployment tools, the automated deployment tools um, that, you, that you want to use? And Trust me, if you deploy an OpenStack cloud, you do want to automate the deployment. People always ask me, well, why can't I, uh, why can't I deploy manually and uh, hack my config files myself? And if so, um, how do I do that? 
And I always tell them that's essentially equivalent to asking the question of if I wanted to drill a hole in my kneecap with a, with a power drill, which drill bit should I use? Um, and there is not a very good answer to that. Uh, and the answer is, of course, well, please just don't drill a hole in your kneecap. Uh, it will be much less painful. Uh, so the automated deployment facility is something that is, uh, that is sort of a, a crucial uh, differentiator uh, between uh, OpenStack vendors. Uh, another one is how do we do HA management? Now this is an interesting one uh, and uh, compared to when we did an earlier version of this talk in Atlanta, there's actually something really interesting that has happened which is pretty much all the vendors have uh, settled on a single stack for uh, node availability and service management, which wasn't the case six months ago, but now it is, which is actually quite nice because it has saved us all from a lot of wheel reinvention. And, uh, and finally, uh, the other differentiator is how do uh, individual vendors approach uh, state management and data availability slash replication for, uh, for, their, for their OpenStack uh, deployment. Now, the SUSE way of doing this is uh, for, uh, for deployment. Um, SUSE is built around uh, Crowbar, uh, uh, the, the Crowbar uh, system automation deployment framework, um, which um, wraps Chef. Uh, for uh, high availability, uh, SUSE Cloud, like everyone else, um, has standardized on Pacemaker for service availability, node monitoring, and failover. And uh, for uh, load balancing or uh, making available active-active uh, services, uh, SUSE Cloud has settled on HA proxy. Again, just like pretty much everyone else. So uh, this, the central part is actually something where we're seeing a, a fair amount of convergence in terms of the technology that's being used. Um, although, as, we're gonna, uh, as we might be able to sort of highlight in this talk, and I certainly highlight in, in the talk on, on Wednesday, um, there are some, uh, some pretty important and pretty interesting architectural differences with how the specific vendors have sort of approached um, pacemaker configuration. And, um, and SUSE has also made a design choice in uh, relying essentially on shared storage uh, or DRBD, which is a mode of, of kernel level block replication um, for, um, uh, for state synchronization between services, um, opting for Ceph only uh, on the actual cloud storage side. There's other vendors that basically use Ceph all the way. There's vendors that mix Ceph with uh, MySQL and Galera replication for, uh, for, for SUSE Cloud, that's either actual shared SAN storage or DRBD that support it. Okay, so uh, what exactly is SUSE Cloud? As you may have guessed, it is uh, SUSE's OpenStack-based uh, cloud product. Uh, it saw its first release in 2012 with uh, SUSE Cloud 1.0, which was SX-based. Uh, then there was SUSE Cloud 2.0, uh, which was Grizzly based, and after SUSE Cloud 1.0 and SUSE Cloud 2.0, of course, what followed was SUSE Cloud 3 without a zero, uh, and I almost got bashed when I referred to it as SUSE Cloud 3.0 last time around, so I made a point of fixing the slide this time. Um, this was based uh, on Havana. Uh, it was uh, launched in February of uh, this year, and uh, this was when uh, HA support uh, was actually added. And uh, for SUSE Cloud uh, 4, which is uh, uh, the stuff that we're going to be deploying now, but it hasn't actually been released. Uh, no, it's the other so way around. It has been released, but we're using the post-release uh, fixes. So. so that's why if things, well, no, nothing's <laughs> going to break because we sacrificed chicken. It, yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and SUSE Cloud 4 was the release that added um, Ceph support. Uh, and, and so that's what we're, this, so we're effectively deploying SUSE Cloud 4 plus here, yeah, more or less. Yeah, 4, four plus, uh, some fixes that have been released and others that are not yet released, but will be very soon. <laughs> okay, um, this uh, is based on uh, SLES 11 uh, SP3. Can you share your plans yet on whether uh, this will be rebased on SLES 12, which has just been released? Yeah, uh, so for SUSE Cloud 5, which is, is still, it, yeah, it won't be this year, I don't think. Um, 
we are, I believe, going to support having the compute nodes on SLES 12, um, but I think the rest of the control plane will be on still on SLES 11 SP3. There you go. Um, SUSE Cloud has this interesting approach uh, that I think is actually quite intuitive, which is uh, you, you, you're basically defining node roles, you're, you're, you're effectively defining um, a control node, or rather a set of control nodes in an HA configuration. Uh, you define uh, compute nodes, you define storage nodes, and then you've got your admin node, which is the stuff that actually runs Crowbar, um, and that you can essentially deploy uh, everything from, whether you're bidding from bare metal, uh, or whichever way you choose. Uh, and this is sort of an overview of, uh, of, of what this looks like. And if you fired up your, uh, your build.sh and you've got a reasonably fast machine, then at this time, you probably have already deployed something like this minus the storage node. Um, so just because uh, some people came in late, it might be worth reiterating that, that if you have the files um, and the Git repository, then please don't wait for us to tell you to do anything else. Do um, fire up the build.sh script, which is documented in the readme that was linked at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and yeah, because it takes a while to for Vagrant to fire up these nodes, so good to have that running while you're listening to. So effectively, what you're getting out of that, and it doesn't matter whether you're doing that now or uh, whether you are doing it um, next week or whenever you'd like from your home or office, uh, what is going to get built is uh, you're gonna get an admin node a uh, single node that basically acts as, uh, that hosts your crowbar admin UI, uh, hosts your chef server, uh, and in a, in a bare metal environment also does your DHCP, TFTP, Pixie boot, whatever. Uh, then you've got a control node. Well, actually, in our environment, we're gonna have two. So we're gonna have two controller nodes, uh, which configure in a highly available fashion uh, a database, uh, a message queuing server, uh, the OpenStack API services, uh, the Horizon dashboard, uh, the scheduling services and control services, uh, and also Keystone and uh, an appropriate uh, glance configuration. So you've got this, you get this control node times two. Uh, and as a sort of a departure from what you would deploy in production, but is a, a, you know, a standard um, uh, a standard concession that you're making for, for, the, for the tutorial setting is you've got a single compute node. Now that's of course not realistic uh, in, a, in a production environment. You're typically gonna have any number of compute nodes, but in this case it's just one, uh, so you're actually able to, uh, to fire up a, a virtual machine. Whether or not we're going to be able to get to that in the course of this tutorial, uh, we're not gonna guarantee, but the compute node should definitely be available for you. Okay. By the way, also in the readme uh, are a couple of alternative deployment mechanisms uh, depending on uh, your, your RAM constraints. Yeah, uh, so if you look in the, the demos uh, slash HA subdirectory of the Git repository, which should be the, um, the, the zip file you received as part of the files, unless you cloned it from online, either way, uh, you should have the Git repository unpacked. And in the demos slash HA subdirectory, you'll see there's a build.sh, which by default is configured uh, assuming that you have 16 gig of RAM available and it will build the architecture that Florian just described, including a single compute node. If you only have eight gig, um, then there's a, a build-8gb.sh, uh, which just tweaks a couple of environment variables and that changes the profile, the config, so it won't boot up a compute node, you'll just have the two controllers and it reduces the number of OpenStack services that are deployed as a consequence, so it won't deploy Nova because there's nothing to deploy instances on, but you'll still have a highly available cluster with um, some of the OpenStack services running in it. Uh, so if you have eight gigabytes and you wanna run this, then just source that uh, script. Again, in, in the readme in the demo slash HA subdirectory explains this in full detail. And then we also have a super tiny four gig deployment that only deploys the deploy node, so the admin node, which is interesting if uh, you're resource constrained and you basically just wanna look at what Crowbar, uh, the Crowbar admin interface looks like uh, for SUSE Cloud, but you, on account of those memory constraints, it doesn't really allow you to actually build a cloud. Okay. Yeah, if you wanna do that, just simply type vagrant up admin from the vagrant subdirectory and it will just boot that single single node and then 
launch the crowbar installer. Okay, so uh, what's this crowbar thing? Um, crowbar is a system uh, deployment and or software deployment and automation framework that comes out of Dell originally um, and that SUSE Cloud has sort of settled on as uh, the way to um, actually deploy sort of a cloud environment in an automated fashion. Um, the uh, other vendors do this differently. So for example, Mirantis and uh, Red Hat both focus on a, a puppet-based approach. Uh, Juju, Canonical run, uh, Ubuntu slash Canonical run their own thing with Juju. Um, for, for SUSE Cloud, it happens to be uh, Dell Crowbar. Uh, the individual application units that are being deployed in uh, Crowbar are called bar clamps. Um, so uh, that's just sort of their technical term. Um, and the, the, the meat or the sort of the interesting stuff uh, uh, about or the intelligence about OpenStack Cloud actually uh, is sort of encoded in these bar clamps. And you've got a bar clamp for, uh, say, a pacemaker cluster. You've got a bar clamp for a database. You've got a bar clamp for, uh, for a message broker. You've got a bar clamp for uh, Keystone. You've got one for Glance and so forth. Um, and uh, there are some specific design goals that basically went into uh, adding the HA facilities to Crowbar or to SUSE Cloud, which is uh, you should be able to both build from scratch and upgrade an existing cloud, so not just greenfield installation, but um, actually upgrade an existing cloud as well. Um, there is a flexible allocation of these node roles that I previously mentioned across potentially not one but multiple clusters. Um, there's, of course, automated configuration. And the way the pacemaker bar clamp uh, is wired, I think is actually pretty interesting and pretty nice in the sense that it makes something that is reasonably complex um, quite easy to use. Um, one of the, uh, the, 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 the criticism that the pacemaker stack itself has sort of faced in the past was never exactly about um, uh, uh, stability or, or fencing or recovery or whatnot. It was always essentially usability. So this stuff is essentially hard to get right to, to get configured correctly, such that it actually does what, what you want it to do. Um, and the, the remedy for that is, of course, to basically automate the whole thing along best practices. And that's exactly what this does. Um, now, uh, this is, I think this is really kind of cool about sort of the SUSE approach here, which is uh, the pacemaker bar clamp itself provides basically HA library code for other bar clamps. So uh, you can, when you deploy, say for example, a database, uh, a, a Postgres database in this case, uh, on SUSE Cloud, uh, depending on whether you deploy it to a single uh, standalone node, or you deploy it to a cluster, this thing will actually automatically figure out what it needs to do in order to be properly configured in that context, which is really kind of cool. Um, now, so this is something that, uh, that the pacemaker bar clamp uh, does. It, of course, installs the pacemaker HA manager, uh, which I guess is completely expected. Um, it configures um, your, uh, your pacemaker for um, a, a fencing facility, uh, which is known with the affectionate acronym of Stonith, which of course stands for shoot the other node in the head. Um, in this case, it doesn't really do that. It uses a form of self-fencing um, that is, that is block-based, um, which is also what we're sort of deploying here in this, uh, in this environment. Um, so in, so this, um, this SBD uh, is pre-configured on your dev SDC device if you're running on VirtualBox or def VDC if you're running on um, Looper. Okay, um, and then uh, we, we get essentially our, uh, our, our DOBD, we get our pacemaker GUI uh, that's being set up. That's Hawk, that's the high availability web console. Uh, and uh, now we're gonna take a quick look at how this initial deployment, or what this initial deployment looks like. Let me just switch that off here real quick. On a sec. So this is a behind the scenes uh, glimpse at the, the process that those of you are following along right now uh, it will, will be happening on your laptops um, at some point during the execution of this build script. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, so, so what, what happened here is it's just um, uh, d essentially deploying the, the, the pacemaker bar clamp and everything else happens in Chef. 
essentially. So, uh, and then like once that is uh, actually run and completed, then we should see here uh, popping up shortly um, that it's actually sort of deploying um, a, a pacemaker cluster. There we go. And now we're essentially monitoring what that does. And there's our pacemaker cluster that's running here. So it's, it's, it's been completely configured for two nodes. It's got fencing set up, all the things that basically people sort of hate to do manually on pacemaker clusters. All of that is done uh, automatically here. And that's basically what a, what a healthy node like, uh, looks like. Um, and then we could also basically look at this live here. Um, hang on one sec. There we go. Whoop. There we go. So that uh, that would be the um, the high availability web console called Hawk. Um, this is actually sort of the uh, the complete configuration already. So uh, as you can see here, there's 39 resources configured. If your stuff is uh, still deploying then uh, you uh, will see you know, maybe fewer resources and more uh, coming online as we go. And now, no, no, this is a live one. Oh. And, uh, and Adam is quickly just going to walk you through how uh, to find out the, uh, the IP addresses here for, the, uh, uh, for, for this environment. So feel free to peruse this here. Um, there you go. Yeah. Um, so this is the. Uh, the environment that should be coming up bit by bit as your Vagrant boots up the, the VMs. Um, and oh, it's hidden by the, the Chrome thing. Uh, there you go. Oh, we don't have the. Uh, no, it's fine. Well, I just want to show the. Oh, yes, yeah, a different URL. But so if you go to uh, HTTP colon slash slash localhost uh, colon 3000, then you'll get this web interface. So even after you've already, uh, basically after the first node has finished booting and, and Crowbar has finished installing, you should be able to see your local installation of this web interface. And then as the other nodes join, you'll see them appear here. Uh, initially, they'll appear with just MAC addresses referring to the interface that the, um, that the oh yeah, so Crowbar, Crowbar are the username and passwords for this web interface on port 3000. Um, so localhost, Vagrant is setting up a, an automatic port forward from localhost to the virtual machine just to save you having to type in the uh, IP address. Um, you can access it directly as well, but it's just a, a shortcut. Yeah, and just in case that got lost, if you open the Crowbar interface, uh, the, the username is Crowbar, password is Crowbar. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just quickly show you like a, a whistle-stop tour of the Crowbar interface so that uh, some of what Florian was describing earlier comes to life. Um, so we already have, this is the nodes dashboard, obviously. Um, if you go up here to bar clamps, then we can see all the bar clamps. And again, just a reminder, the uh, bar clamps are essentially plugins to Crowbar that provide um, units of provisioning stuff. So and it, from the names on the left-hand side here, it should be pretty obvious uh, what those particular components are that it's provisioning. Uh, so all the, the, the bare metal and the crowbar registration process for the, the nodes uh, happens with the, the core crowbar bar clamps at the top. And then the ones lower down are for deploying OpenStack. And the first one of those, as you can see, is the pacemaker one, which on, on here, we've, uh, we've already deployed. Uh, and we have the uh, cluster up and running with some of the OpenStack services in already. For you, probably it won't have got to this stage yet. Um, but I'll, I'll just go into the pacemaker bar clamp settings so you can see some of the things that Florian was describing in real life. So um, the first thing to note here is that you can have multiple clusters simply just by clicking the create button and you know giving a, a new cluster a new name. Uh, and then once you've done that, you can go into the cluster. Here I'm just going to stick with one cluster because we're running it all on a single machine in VMs. Um, but you could easily have multiple ones. So if we go into this, then we have some of the options that Florian was mentioning before. So the Stonith option is currently set to shared block device, uh, or Stonith block device, depending on how you want to call it. Uh, but there are other options for IPMI, out-of-band management, and so on. Um, even a, a sort of non-production uh, thing for using talking to the libvert hypervisor if you're doing this in, uh, with libvert, then you can use libvert as the Stonith mechanism. But 
obviously not for production. Uh, there's the disk, the shared disk device parameters that Farin mentioned earlier, email notifications and so on, DRBD, HA proxy. Um, we've just stuck with all of the defaults for this demo and that should work fine. Um, the most interesting part of this screen is the allocation of crowbar nodes to this HA controller cluster. Uh, so crowbar has uh, the not just you know bare metal provisioning and registration, but hardware inventory and network management and so on. And um, w once that whole process of getting a node into the crowbar environment is complete, then it will appear here on the left as one of the nodes which is available for allocation to a particular role. Um, so to add it to the cluster, you simply just drag the um, the node from here to to the right hand side to the um, pacemaker cluster member role. Um, so it looks like that. Obviously, controller one's already in there, so it's not going to. Oops. Uh, it's just going to say it's already assigned. Um, but this also means that even though we have the two node cluster up and running, if I had another node spare that I provisioned at a later date, it would just appear here. I could drag it into there, hit apply, and it would join the cluster automatically. And then it would be all the services would be, become available on that node as well, uh, or at least all the active, active services. Uh, so that's a quick view of the, the pacemaker bar clamp, and um, so for, for those of you actually, you know, following along or running build sh, um, how many of you can actually get to a crowbar interface? Can we have a quick show. Okay, cool. All on this side, interestingly. Yeah. <laughs> this is the spectator side, I guess. <laughs> okay, so let me switch back here to the uh, to the deck. We're gonna we're gonna come back to the to the Hawk interface uh, later do on. Do you want to do the hands left and right hands? Thing? The, we we do have a number of um, conspicuous green hats and green lanyards in the room planted at strategic points. So uh, if you are having problems with any aspect of this, um, maybe raise your uh, left hand to indicate you need help from someone who knows this environment, and um, hopefully they will notice and come to you. Bernhard? I think he needs a bit of help. We'll, we'll have to do that sort of within certain limits, of course, because we're not going to be able to sort of have people darting around. If you actually do get like completely stuck um, somewhere, then don't worry about it too much. You're, like, I, like we said earlier, you're easily going to be able to uh, recreate this whole environment. Adam did a fantastic job basically documenting the whole thing uh, piece by piece. Um, so by all means, uh, if, you, if you do happen to get stuck here, uh, it's perfectly fine if you uh, if you want to sort of um, follow along or, or, or replicate this tutorial uh, later on. So um, I, I'd just like to point out quickly. So the the screen I just showed and those options, you won't need to make uh, apply those settings yourself because the the build script, the build.sh, after it finishes the Vagrant up, booting all the machines, it's going to launch uh, a, another batch script which will automatically start applying those and building your cluster and and launching the OpenStack services in it. Um, so, so you don't need to do anything manually, but feel free to click around that interface, um, and you can also click. Ar uh, you can also go to the Hawk interface on uh, HTTPS localhost seven six three zero, and you can see a cluster view. But we'll, we'll get onto that in a second. Okay, so. Uh, uh very briefly, so sort of what's, what's special about the way that SUSE Cloud does here. Uh, it uses these uh, lightweight resource providers uh, in Chef for uh, deploying Pacemaker. And uh, like I said, this is what uh, affects in the background the fact that uh, depending on what type of node, whether, you, uh, whether you're selecting a single node or a cluster to deploy to a, uh, to deploy a specific service on, uh, it will automatically detect, OK, do I, do I need to be deployed standalone here, or do I need to be deployed as part of, uh, of a cluster, which I always think is a, is a really nice and, and sort of elegant approach of, of doing things. Um, OK, so DRBD then is, uh, is also being configured uh, for uh, replication of your, uh, of your database and of your uh, RabbitMQ uh, message broker. And HA proxy is configured as the load balancer. Uh, the entire cluster configuration is essentially completely automatic, so it's it's uh, it's pretty much completely hands off. Once you deploy uh, these um, these bar clamps, 
uh, you are essentially good to go. OK. Um, so uh, what, what this does for you is it basically orchestrates uh, and synchronize your, uh, synchronizes your data state across your cluster. Uh, it provides for uh, flexible um, allocation of these node roles, provides notifications, and all of that is wonderful. Um, so now moving on to uh, the database bar clamp. This is where sort of um, this kind of really starts showing as to, uh, as to what this can actually do. So what the database bar clamp will do for you is it will deploy, lo and behold, a relational database management system that you can then use for persistent data storage in OpenStack. And the way it does that, it, it deploys uh, Postgres. So SUSE is, to the best of my knowledge, the only OpenStack vendor that has basically standardized on Postgres as its relational database. Everyone else seems to be preferring MySQL or some flavor thereof. Um, so this installs Postgres in HA mode, that is to say under pacemaker management, and that includes uh, appropriate DRBD configuration for Postgres. So that's actually, it's a reasonably complex task and it's uh, actually quite different from sort of a single node Postgres deployment. And it's really kind of nice uh, to be able to do all of that essentially in one fell swoop. So let's kick this off here real quick. So that's our Postgres development, uh, Postgres deployment. There we go. Uh, hang on, let me just scroll down here so we can actually see that. So this is actually sort of what's happening in the, uh, in the, in the pacemaker cluster. Um, so, um, well, we're basically seeing a bunch of stuff that's happening there in the background, and then here we go. So that's our DRBD that's being fired up automatically and it's being synchronized. Uh, then we get a file system that's being created on that in a highly available configuration, and that gets fired up. Um, and then we've got um, our actual Postgres services um, that are being fired up here as well. Let me scroll that up here a little bit. Oh. So we can actually see that. And that's our Postgres database coming up. <coughs> and now that's running. And then finally, the last thing we fire up is a virtual IP. So we can make sure that regardless of which node, uh, which physical node the, the, the Postgres service is running on at any given time, all of our other services can happily connect to it. Show Hawk. No. Hang on a second. There we go. Um, okay, uh, next up, uh, RabbitMQ bar clamp. This is relatively similar uh, in a way. So it effectively configures RabbitMQ in high availability mode. Again, this is something where uh, depending on whether you deploy it to a single node or you deploy it uh, to a cluster, it's uh, configured uh, completely differently. Uh, it also uses DRBD, and uh, there we go. So we get to show some live stuff. Yeah. People are picking this up. And uh, actually, since this is pretty much the same thing as we as we get in um, uh, in in uh, in Postgres, let's just skip over that for now. Um, which saves us a little bit of time sort of at the, at the end of the talk. And then basically what happens is um, in sort of an orderly linear fashion, what you're deploying is all these other bar clamps. So there's a bar clamp for Keystone, which puts Keystone under pacemaker management. I'm gonna skip over the, over the ASCII casts now because you, because you can always refer back to those later. Uh, then we deploy Glance, um, again under pacemaker management. Cinder uh, under pacemaker management. And, oops, there we go. What the hell? So if, you've, um, if your four nodes are booted up, you should be at the point where you're seeing uh, the output from Vagrant is applying the various bar clamp proposals for these things in the sequence what that the Florian just described. Um, <clears throat> and it, it's doing that in, in batch using a, a simple YAML file, um, which you can actually find in slash root if you SSH or log in to the, uh, to the admin node. Uh, we can show that in a second. This is interesting, but yeah. let's just go Let, back to this. And uh, let's actually, oops. Yeah. Okay, and uh, what we're gonna do now is presumably at this time, most of you are going to have this stuff essentially fully 
uh, fully configured and fully deployed. So this is roughly what it should look like. Uh, this is roughly what your what your whole con console should look like. Th so this is not um this is not the full deployment yet. I deliberately on on this one that we've set up, I've deliberately stopped it uh, short of deploying everything so that we can actually see something deploy live because, you know, just a bunch of slides. Uh, after a while, I think eyes begin to glaze over. Um, so uh, we're going to do that. Uh, if Again, the, so this is the Hawk web interface uh, that gives you a view into the cluster. It's available, it's running on both nodes in the cluster because obviously if something goes wrong with one of the nodes, you still want to be able to get a view of what's going on in the cluster. Uh, so the way you get to this in this, in this Vagrant-based environment, uh, again, is HTTPS, the S is very important, uh, colon slash slash localhost colon, and then the port number is 7630. 7630, and on, that's for one controller, and 7631 is the other controller, so you should be able to log into either of those and you'll get the same view. Um, so so your, your clusters, if, if, you're, if you've got to this point now, uh, your clusters may not be as fully populated as this yet, but you should be seeing uh, the resources appear as it goes through the script applying the bar, the bar clamp settings. Um, and w what I can do now, uh, or in a bit, is, is to maybe do uh, apply another of the proposals. And we can actually see Chef um, doing stuff behind the scenes. And we see the resources yeah, um, kick in here. Let's, let's do that real quick. So we've got, uh, we've got a couple of, of uh, resources still missing. You want to do that in your box? Um, I, I will do it on here. I think I'll SSH from a, a terminal so that people can see. Um, what's going on? I think. If you want to do that, that's fine. Yeah, yeah I think the only ch ah, and that's why I have a microphone stand here, because typing with one hand is not fun. Maybe what we could do uh, first before we actually deploy a new service is basically show some high availability to some of these services themselves. Sure. Basically, show service recovery. Um, so um, Adam is now going to select one of these services that are deployed here, um, and he's just going to kill them on one of the nodes, and then we'll just see um, how we how we recover from that from that. What do you want in our terminal? There you go. Yeah. Okay. the app sign. There we go. Oh, this thing. <laughs> what is that? Alt Q. Yeah. <laughs> Must be like Twitter. Um, what is it? 42 dot? I'm oh. one, I think. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Oh, there we go. So I'm just, right, so now I'm in the, uh, the demo laptop rather than the presentation laptop. And now from there, I'll SSH into the admin uh, server VM, which is the first one that booted up when you ran the script. Okay, and uh, in case you haven't found it in the documentation, the root password for all of these VMs is Vagrant. If you want to SSH in as root uh, or log in from the, the console of your VirtualBox GUI, otherwise, either way is fine. Oh, that's what it is. Right, so from here, I can SSH into either of the controller nodes, and Crowbar sets up a trust relationship between the admin node and the others uh, with the keys, SSH keys shared through Crowbar and Chef. Oops. This is really awkward. <laughs> okay, so now we're in the one of the controller nodes in the cluster. And this is, this is our uh, command line view of the state of the cluster. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, 
from the admin node, I'm going to run the crowbar batch script, which uh, will apply another bar clamp, and then we'll look at the, uh, the internals of the chef logs as the config management kicks in, and we'll also look at the uh, Hawk interface. Oh, sh shall I first kill a service and yeah. just demonstrate? Yeah. OK, so before I do that, I I'm just going to do a, a simple failover demo uh, by killing, say, Keystone. Um, on, on controller one, and we'll just, yeah. Actually, that's gonna be a relatively boring service recovery, uh, not just a full, not a full service failover, but still, uh, we're gonna see uh, sort of an automated service recovery there. Which country does this keyboard come from? Ah, oh, it's a German keyboard, so good luck with that. But I, in my defense, I did warn you ahead of the tutorial here, but you'll manage. OK, so the, the penultimate line there, you see process 6181 is the keystone. Um, and if I do, so th this is the Hawk web interface, so we'll keep it. Uh, so you can see this row here shows uh, that each, each column represents uh, which services are running on a particular controller node, so all the the left-hand services are from one controller and the right-hand from another. So if, if you're at this stage, feel free to try this out. You can uh, attempt a, a service uh, failure simulation. So I'm going to kill 6181. Uh, and it's already started it back up, actually. And uh, you can see the there's a, a warning, warning at the sign top. up there. And yeah, a warning sign just here as well. But it started it back up. So if I so you can see it started back up with a different process ID now. So it's just a very simple service uh, high availability thing. But we'll do will kill a controller, which is far more interesting in a, in a, in a bit. Sorry? So the, the question was, is this, is this done through Monit? No, this is actually what Pacemaker is good at. <laughs> and, it, and, it does it, and does it in a way, in a configurable way, that you can uh, effectively check not only for, say, the presence of a specific process, uh, but you might also, for example, talk to um, to a socket that that process monitors, check whether you actually get good data back, um, et cetera. So this is uh, the, the, the monitoring facility in, in Pacemaker is sort of built right in. Uh, it's built into every single Pacemaker resource agent. And uh, we can also interface with any uh, LSB uh, uh, that is Sys5 in it, or Upstart, or, uh, or Systemd uh, unit, or, or job, or, or script. OK, so we have. Um all the bar clamps up to Neutron deployed. So the next one is Nova. So I'm going to kick off a deployment of Nova in the cluster, and we'll watch the internals as that goes through. And I, I could do this through the web interface through through here just by clicking Create and then at setting the parameters. Um, but I, I've got a, a script that will do the same thing. And this is the script that you're uh, builds are already running automatically. Oops. Oh. That's fine. Yeah. Just leave it like That's that. That's fine. Okay. I'm just going to type line. Um. Oh yeah. So just in case you're interested, the uh, the YAML file that this this tool is building, you c it's it's in the the root directory on the on this admin node here. So you can feel free to have a look at that. I'll just flash it up quickly. Um, so there's just a, a section for each bar clamp. And there you can see in the middle of the screen is the one for Nova. So it's very simple. Really, it's, all it's doing is taking the defaults. And uh, well, more or less, it's enabling uh, uh, well, actually, kernel same page merging, which in this case we're using VirtualBox, not libvirt, so um, that's not particularly useful, but it doesn't do any harm because uh, we're not using that hypervisor. But it, it um, allocates the controller services 
from Nova, like Nova API and so on, to the cluster, and then it assigns uh, the compute one node uh, that we built earlier to be the hypervisor, and it's a QEMU software hypervisor in this case. So I'm going to uh, build that. And actually, I'm going to get another terminal ready so that we can tail some logs as that's building. So that's basically just another terminal that we're sort of opening here uh, on, on the admin node so that we're able to tail our logs as we go along. Stop. Okay. There we go. Right, so this is just going to watch all the activity that is happening by behind the scenes from the Chef configuration management platform running on the individual nodes as orchestrated by Crowbar as we uh, apply the Nova installation process. Oops. Oh, yeah. I forgot the YAML file. Okay, so it's created a, a configuration and it's now committing it. There we go. Um, so this is the log files actually on, on both controller nodes um, and in fact the compute node as well. So there'll, there'll be an awful lot of stuff here. You'll, you'll see... Um, Various chef log lines flip past, uh, referring to pacemaker. Um, I won't go into details about those now, but the interesting part of what it's doing here is the synchronization, because at certain points it has to wait for all nodes to reach a certain point in the configuration before proceeding. Uh, for example, you don't want to insert a pacemaker resource into the cluster for Nova API until, uh, which is an active active. Uh, clone resource until you have all the Nova necessary Nova packages installed and configured and ready to run it. Uh, because if that resource gets inserted onto one node in the cluster, um, then it, it will run across all of them because it's a clone resource. So um, there are various interesting challenges that we've had to overcome for this to work. Um, oh, let's switch to the Hawk interface. And as you can see, so there in the background, we got. Right now, we, the point that we got to was just to a Nova managed DB sync. So we're basically we're firing up our, our Nova for the first time. We're populating our database with the appropriate schemas, um, and then now we've got a bunch of other uh, Nova services such as Nova Console Auth and so forth. Uh, now we're actually adding those services to uh, the to the HA proxy configuration, um, as you as you could see from some of the lines that flew by there. Um, and uh, at this point, we're actually starting to add uh, these services to the CRM configuration. Uh, they're being added here with uh, the stop rule, which means just add them to the configuration for now uh, and hold off for a bit before you actually stop, uh, start them, and here we go. So these are all of our Nova services that were now sort of being deployed uh, in a highly available fashion across those two uh, control nodes. So now we've got a, not only a Nova API service, uh, but we've also got uh, a, a, um, a scheduler, console auth, uh, et cetera. So, and as you can see here, that bar clamp uh, is just about to turn green, so it's still in progress here, but we should see that, uh, that little light turn green. Uh, in, in just a little bit, and then we can continue on uh, with Horizon, and then we're actually done with our uh, with with the with the configuration of sort of a basic compute cloud. And if you then want to sort of uh, continue on, you can still add heat to that. You can you you can add Swift to that, uh, whatever you would like. 
So um, it, it's up to you, like how, depending on how far your laptop has got through this, it, to, to apply all the bar clamps and have all the OpenStack services up and running takes quite a while, but you know, depending on your laptop, uh, the amount of RAM you have available and the processors and SSD versus spindles and so on. Um, you, you don't, if you want to attempt to failover um, and do nasty things to your cluster, you don't necessarily have to wait for the whole cluster to come up. Um, you, you know, things might get a bit messy, but I've documented both the, uh, the failover, the process for simulating um, a catastrophic failure of a, of a whole controller node. Well, that's just simply, you just hit, hit the reset or power off button on VirtualBox um, and just watch the Hawk interface running on the other controller node, not the one that you've just killed, otherwise it will just freeze, obviously. Um, so you can, you can either wait for uh, this process to finish on your build um, completely, uh, but you, you can also just, yeah, try, try the uh, simulated there we go. failover. Yeah, and that's so, done. So should we, I, I could make it do all of the, the rest of them, or, or I could do a, a failover now. Um, we can, I mean, we, we can, can maybe take some questions about how. I, I, I suggest we, uh, we, we continue essentially with a, with a node failover. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's, I mean. So we have another 30 minutes? Approximately, yeah. But I'm, I'm sure that people don't, are, are, are not uh, hugely mad at us if you get to hit the booth crawl a little <laughs> early. Um, so that's good, I guess. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead with a uh, with an actual node failover because that's ultimately sort of what we're building um, HA systems for. Um, and Adam, if you could perhaps uh, show us a CRM mon that we keep running in one of these terminals, um, and also um, then we can sort of flip back and forth between. Uh, flip back and forth between. Uh, there we go. Okay between that and the, and the Hawk uh, console is what I meant to say. So here we go. Um, so as you can see, uh, we're on, uh, we, we started this on controller two now. For those of you who are not familiar with Pacemaker, pretty much any node in the Pacemaker cluster can act as a management node. So therefore, uh, you can um, not only connect to the cluster, but also configure it from any node. Uh, in this case, uh, we're, we're um, connecting from controller two, but we, of course, get the full view of the, of the cluster here. Um, so as you can see, all these resources that we're running here, and because uh, Adam cleverly connected to controller two to fire up Sierra Mon, I'm surmising that he's now gonna kill controller one, um, so we can actually see this stuff fail over. Uh, I'm gonna have to do this from the other laptop because VirtualBox is running on, on that, so. Yeah. So uh, well, actually, I could just do an Echo B. Uh, let's go ahead and just kill it from VirtualBox, just to be just to pretend that someone actually... They don't believe in what I'm doing. Either. Yeah, just, uh, but you know, the chicken is ripped up and that's fine. So what we're, what we're now gonna do is we're effectively gonna uh, pull the power plug, which for those of you familiar with HA uh, environments is actually sort of the, uh, the simple failure, but uh, there are, uh, but Pacemaker actually handles more complex failures uh, really, really well as well. When uh, provided that you've uh, that you've configured appropriate fencing, um, I think actually this Hawk interface is the one running on controller one. That's why I suggested you just keep the CRM mon open. So let's just. Oh, I see. Uh, well, it's nice to see. I'll switch to the uh, the other Hawk one because it's nice to see it happen in Hawk as well. Um, we can flip between them as it, as it's failing over. You could have just hit F11 in the full screen mode. Um, now you're back in full screen. There you go, F11 here. Yep. Okay, where are we? So yeah, this is um, forwarding to the local port forwarding from the host to the other, the Hawk running on the other controller node. Oh, did we forget to say the login for this is HA, HA cluster, cluster and crowbar. crowbar. Sorry, uh, th that may not even be documented, whoops. <laughs> it's HA cluster and crowbar, that's why you come here, you know, to find these things out. Someone should have screamed if you <laughs> were pondering that. 
Okay, so we've got those two views of the same cluster from controller two. I'm now gonna ki kill controller one, which is particularly mean because controller one is currently the master for DRBD, so which will affect the database and rabbit. Um, all the active active services, um, it will just simply carry on running on controller two and not much will happen, but the, that will fail over. I've just hit reset on controller one. It'll take a few seconds uh, for the monitoring to kick in. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So the uh, the monitoring is set to uh, uh, ten second intervals by by default. So uh, you'll get an average of a five second wait. Oh. And you can see a bunch of services are now stopped uh, on one of the machines, and stuff is happening. Um, and yeah, now we have the other side is the master for DRBD. Can you track the USB man? Sorry, can you switch back to the uh, console? There you go. There's uh, one sort of important thing that I want to point out here, and that's sort of a, it's another sort of point of differentiation or uh, a point of uh, how certain vendors do certain things in, in different ways, as I foreshadowed earlier on. Uh, as I said, pretty much all the OpenStack vendors these days use Pacemaker for service management. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, the SUSE approach is one where you're using a relatively small set of virtual IP addresses. In fact, there's only three. Uh, there's one virtual IP address for your database. Um, that's this one up here. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, so you've got a, a, a virtual IP for your database. You've got a virtual IP for Rabbit. And then you've got a virtual IP for essentially all the OpenStack services. Um, now, that makes the whole thing relatively simple um, as a setup. Um, uh, it has a, a bit of a downside, which is um, the fact that if uh, during the time a service recovers, because the IP address is still available, um, that service will temporarily actually have sort of a, a, a user-facing, um, say, service unavailable, like a 503 or, or, or something like that. Um, other vendors use a slightly different approach here, which is uh, a, a virtual IP address per service. Uh, which means that you can always essentially, the, the minute something is wrong with the service, you can tear down the IP so you make sure that there's actually no client accesses hitting that at all. Uh, just depends. Uh, it's essentially, it's a conscious design decision in this case. Uh, it's been done this way. It's not any better or worse than the other, but it's something that you ought to be aware of. Um, there is actually sort of a... Uh, uh, an improvement that I had the liberty to propose last week, um, so that may actually, you know, become uh, even more robust in the uh, in the near future. Uh, but that's the way that it's currently done. And as you can see, uh, you've got uh, HA proxy itself that is being managed as a highly available resource, basically with a with a virtual IP address, and then all the other services that act essentially as backend servers or real servers to uh, to to HA proxy. And um, as you could see, in like less than 30 seconds, the entire failover completed. Um, the uh, the other node is still marked as offline, so suppose it actually suffered some sort of near permanent or catastrophic failure. Uh, that's fine. The services still hum along uh, nicely. Uh, you make sure that not only are the services available, uh, but also that they actually have uh, and find the data that they uh, that they previously had. Um, I just just wanted to can, prove that. And we can still nicely interact with our OpenStack services. There we go, and that's our keystone that's still happily alive and, 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 and working nicely, um, as you would expect it to. So that's pretty much exactly what you want. And like I said, um, this is, um, you can also get you know, highly available OpenStack from Mirantis, you can get it from Red Hat, you can get it from Ubuntu. Uh, this is one way of doing it, and uh, in my humble opinion, it's actually a pretty elegant way um, of, of, uh, of, of deploying that. Um, Okay, so let's see. Uh, you may have noticed earlier on that uh, my my presentation here went berserk briefly. Uh, let's see if that is uh, treating us any more nicely now. Uh, there is no berserking anymore. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so just a few words about sort of uh, a, a little bit of background uh, on how this is actually configured. Um, so. Uh, your, your Neutron configuration in this, uh, in this default config uh, 
uh, is with uh, open vSwitch with GRE tunnels through uh, the multiple layer two, uh, modular layer two uh, plugin, the ML2 plugin. Um, VLANs are also supported um, and, uh, and that's that. Uh, I don't think you're advocating Nova Network at all, right? Right. Which is great. Uh, this is, um, uh, actually this is a bit of a departure of what other vendors are doing. So for example, if you deploy, um, uh, if you deploy RDO, then it still has a Nova network option. But I think it's great to just go Neutron only. Um, I think that's perfectly fine. Okay, uh, a few words about the, the Nova bar clamp here, uh, Nova under pacemaker management. This is the stuff that Adam just deployed. Um, and uh, you can also refer back to uh, the little ASCII cast that we have for that. And then finally, uh, there is a Horizon bar clamp uh, which deploys Apache and the OpenStack dashboard in a highly available fashion. Um, this is actually not very spectacular uh, because Horizon itself is a completely stateless service. The only thing that you need to make sure is that you have a number of, uh, of Apache instances um, that load the, um, the OpenStack dashboard configuration uh, and through ModWizGi. Uh, and off you go. So that's really not a big deal. And then the only thing that is, gets actually, is actually being put under pacemaker management is uh, we have the several Apache backends uh, that are plugged into the HA proxy configuration and then a virtual IP address uh, that um, gets an additional port uh, that we can then use to interact with, uh, with Horizon, with the OpenStack dashboard. Um, now, uh, how do you test uh, for high availability? Uh, so basically, if you've deployed this, um, the stuff that uh, Adam just did a moment ago, um, you can uh, retrieve your Horizon URL, for example, from Crowbar, um, and then you can select the, uh, the, the default uh, OpenStack tenant. You can use it as you normally would any other uh, OpenStack uh, installation. The only thing that you're gonna notice is that there's actually a SUSE logo um, in the left top. Um, and then you can do, you can start doing bad things to services, um, such as, for example, if you want to uh, go ahead and kill your Keystone or uh, kill your Nova API or whatever you'd like, and then you can watch your services recover automatically, either in CRM1 or in the high availability web console in Hawk. Um, and frequently, uh, the recovery is going to be so fast that you're not even going to notice. So what I like to do is I actually do a uh, kill-9 uh, process ID semicolon CRM mon to make sure that it actually starts monitoring the cluster um, recovery immediately. Um, and then, there we go. And then you can also start doing bad things to nodes, um, such as a hard power off or a hard reboot. Uh, or, uh, uh, or, or, or triggering uh, with echo O or echo B to SysRQ trigger a hard shutdown or a hard reboot, whatever you prefer. So echo O to proc SysRQ trigger uh, actually shuts off the machine uh, without doing anything else and echo B to proc SysRQ trigger triggers a hard reboot. And um, we have the, there is a document, well, there's a couple of documents in the same demos slash HA directory, one that um, goes through the process of, of doing a simulating a failover, another one that explains doing recovery afterwards if you want to then um, clean up your cluster again and then try doing some more uh, failover testing or, or deploying new services. Um, and then you can also watch not only um, the, 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 the node being properly marked offline or fenced or whichever, uh, but also you can watch the, the services fail over uh, automatically with, again, CRM1 or with the high availability uh, web console. And uh, yeah, we already showed that, so that's good. So quick summary, um, things that we wanted to show you today, and I hope we did. Um, wha what is the motivation behind OpenStack HA? Why do we need infrastructure HA in the first place? Recall, we have a bunch of services that we need to be available and we have a bunch of services that also need some form of replicated or shared state. Um, I briefly went over uh, some of the other vendors' approaches to OpenStack HA. Like I said, um, on Wednesday there's gonna be another talk uh, that goes into that in uh, more detail uh, and, uh, and Adam then demonstrated how this is actually done with uh, SUSE Cloud HA. So recall uh, Crowbar, Chef Deployment, Pacemaker and HA proxy for um, service management and high availability. Um, and, uh, and then finally, largely uh, DRBD or shared storage uh, for storage and data availability. 
Uh, okay, um, if you want to use or reuse these slides, you are certainly welcome to do so. Uh, they are under a Creative Commons attribution share alike license, so if you find anything of this useful, please by all means go ahead and uh, use and reuse it. Um, this is uh, the link to the GitHub repo uh, containing the sources of the slides. So the, the QR code that we showed at the top of the talk was these slides rendered uh, and, and, and these are um, these are the actual um, slide sources. Yeah. So the the, the uh, intention uh, for the future of the Vagrant repository, which contains the Vagrant file and the box definitions and all the documentation about how to set up this environment and play around with it, um, the intention is to maintain that and keep on providing it and hopefully update it for uh, future releases and so on. So. Um, Feel free to keep keep an eye on that as it as it develops. But uh, as it stands, you should be able to, you know, within an hour or so, um, stand up the entire environment um, that we've shown you here um, as on, on any machine, assuming it has enough enough RAM. And then, of course, you can also deploy this whole thing to the bare metal, which is what it was originally built for. Um, and uh, see. <laughs> Um, and at least like from the from the crowbar side, it's essentially it's a, it's a completely linear process. You basically start out with your pacemaker bar clamp, and then you start adding bar clamps as you wish. Uh, or of course, you could use basically a crowbar batch job uh, to to affect the same thing. Um, and with that, we've actually come to the end of the tutorial. We are, I think, a little early, which means that uh, we can take a little uh, more time, number one, for questions, and number two, if any one of you uh, followed along and got stuck somewhere along the way, we can, uh, we can, take, uh, we can basically yep. help you on your, on your machines here, and we'll be happy to do that. Um, if there are no further questions, then yes, you have, okay, there's questions. Go ahead. <laughs> Ralph, do you want to take that? No, no, let me back up on that. I have a slide for oh, that okay. that I skipped over <laughs> earlier. Just a second. Uh, Ralph off the hook. Yeah, hang on a second. Oh, come on. Oh, where's my slide? No, that's taking too long. Anyway, uh, so uh, you're, what you're highlighting is a uh, what you're highlighting is an important point uh, with high availability uh, to the uh, neutron uh, L3 agent. Uh, in uh, as of I think in Grizzly we got what at the time was called quantum scheduler, um, which allowed us to um, distribute uh, uh, virtual routers onto multiple L3 agents. But the assignment was completely static, which is bad because if you uh, if that L3 agent then dies, then there's no automatic way to fail over. And um, what SUSE ships is a thing called Neutron HA tool. Uh, which basically detects, okay, well, here's a, an L3 agent that has died. So now we need to basically grab the, uh, uh, the virtual routers that were uh, assigned to that agent, which you can do essentially with the equivalent of neutron router agent list. Um, or is it agent router list? I forget, whatever it is. Um, and then you can fail over. This is actually uh, an important topic in my Wednesday talk because... Uh, there are some really interesting things that are happening in OpenStack right now with uh, DVR and uh, highly available um, uh, L3 agents, uh, which are marked uh, experimental for Juno, but are expected to be fully supported in Kilo. And uh, when that happens, then we're essentially expecting to sort of be able to do away with this kind of approach where we sort of have to do this, this, this manual um, this manual translation, this manual shifting of, of uh, Yeah, that's a fair summary. So, so uh, we had to write uh, a new resource agent that wraps around the... That's going berserk again for whatever reason. Yeah, I was trying to switch it away. Yeah, from no worries. Um, yeah, so that we, we have this fairly lightweight custom pacemaker resource agent that wraps around the tool and runs a... Um, I think the stop action doesn't do anything but start and monitor 
uh, or maybe it's just start, I can't remember, but if you want to know more details, Ralph is at the back and he wrote it. That's a, that, that's a general problem that we have, though, in, in OpenStack as, as up to Icehouse. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's sort of exactly the problem that, uh, that the highly available L3 agent uh, in Juno fixes, which not only um, makes sure that the agent remains available, but actually does connection tracking uh, replication, so basically contract the connection state replication, uh, such that when we fail over, uh, we actually don't even, we should, well, most applications shouldn't even be uh, required to um, reinitiate a connection, yeah, which would be cool. Sure. There's, there's not much to figure out there. Um, it, it's just, yeah, it's just, uh, that's just, sorry, limitation of, yeah, it's. It's just, uh, yeah, there's a brief time where the network is disconnected, but you don't need to restart any instances or something. Okay. The network continues. But, but the, yeah, but the, but the problem is that if, the, if you have any outgoing connections, like, for example, TCP connections, uh, then, the in, then, then that uh, connection may need to be restarted from either inside the instance or from whatever the service outside needs to connect into the instance the because no connection tracking. Right, that's true, but you don't need to reboot any instance no, or something. No, of course not. That, no, I you don't need to restart the instance yeah. itself. No. Okay, do we have more questions, sir, for the general plenary? <laughs> yeah, one more, go ahead. The uh, Judge Wolf device that you pointed out is that FTP. Is it from a bare metal installation that you usually use for that I schedule, for an SDI schedule? Whatever you want, just any 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 block device. So it just happens to be STC here because STB was what we used for DRBD and that just happened to be the way I ordered the disks in the SCSI controller setup. And, um, and, and, that, and that is only if you actually want to use SBD for fencing. Right. Uh, but we had this same yeah. discussion this morning in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the HA design summit session, uh, which is what, what assumptions do you, make? Uh, do you make? Do you make assumptions as to, for example, the availability of IPMI devices that you can use for fencing? Uh, or do you not? And then you you have to you have to have some other sort of um, uh, fencing facility. Yeah. So you can see here you can use any any block device path, um, and it can be different per node as well, depending you know whatever you've set up. Um, and if yeah, if you choose a different Stonus option, then you get different parameter options. Uh, well. Yeah, in that case, it, there's a separate IPMI bar clamp for taking care of the ILO type stuff, so it just refers to the configuration of that one. Um, so it's all, yeah, the parameters that you might need to change are exposed, and the ones that you probably don't are not exposed. Although there are still some behind the scenes that you can tweak um, that are not exposed in the interface. So there's a raw thing in here as well. Um, and there's, a, of course, a REST API and a you know, command line interface and so on. So uh, you can do it programmatically. Well, it, it depends on your fencing device. But so for, for SBD, um, the default timeout is three seconds. Um, although, actually, for this environment, I've upped that to 30 seconds because VMs can be pretty sluggish. Um, but, yeah, it depends on the, the fence, fencing device in question. All right, so if anyone, yeah, has, has had problems with their setup that they want us to look at or, or just questions about it, and then feel free to grab us afterwards. But and um, we'll see you at the booth crawl. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks.